How many of you now, now that it's, it's getting, you know, if you go back this way, you're going to be going back 50 years, okay? A lot of folks weren't born when this happened, but how many of you remember sports events back in the 70s and 80s, and we had the rainbow, rainbow afro dude? How many of you remember him? Yeah, you remember him? He, he, he came to the 1977 World Series the first time, uh, and then he would show up at, at, at uh, the Super Bowl and all sorts of sports events, and he'd shake his head, and he'd be in front of the camera, and he became a Christian in 1980, so he started putting Jesus saves on his shirts, and then he eventually put John 3.16, and that's what he got known for. He was the John 3.16 guy. Now, unfortunately, this, the poor fellow had mental problems, and uh, eventually and he, he started losing it somewhere around 1990. He showed up at the, at, I think it was U.S. Open, and he blew an air horn right before Jack Nicklaus hit a putt. Uh, that wasn't good. And then he got where, I don't know why he did this, he got where he'd light stink bombs and leave those places. And then he abducted a maid at a hotel, and he ended up getting uh, three life pr uh, prison sentences. So today he's 79 and sitting in prison. So I don't, you know, he struggled with John 3.16, obviously. Uh, but you remember him, and, and he made, really, he, he made John 3.16 come back to life in a lot of ways. And boy, people were just all over it. Now that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. <coughs> because often when we talk about John 3.16, uh, we do a sermon just on that one verse, and that's good. It's good to bring God's word out. But it's really a verse that needs context. It's really a verse that you need to study. And so today, I'm going to back us up a little bit from John 3.16. I really, really want you to study these texts that I'm talking about today because it's important. You need to read it on your own. And these are the red letters. This is the red letter series. And I'm going to paraphrase the words of Jesus as he speaks to Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is a very, very educated man, and he did live by all of those laws. He is a Pharisee, and they are well-trained religiously. Not only is he a Pharisee, in all likelihood, he is a member of the Sanhedrin. This is a powerful man. He's probably wealthy. We'll talk about that a little bit later. He comes to Jesus at night, and it's been popular to preach that, well, he did that under the cloak of darkness because he didn't want anybody to know he's going. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure a member of the Sanhedrin would have been that worried. Uh, I would rather think that probably he wanted a private audience with Jesus, and that's real hard to get during the day because Jesus gets tied up. So he comes to Jesus, and he basically says, Rabbi, we can see that you are a teacher sent from God uh, because nobody can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. Now, that really sounds like a confession. I mean, he's real close. He's right there. He says, boy, I see that you're a teacher sent from God. The problem with that, folks, is every Muslim on the planet also believes that. They believe he was a teacher sent from God. And he gets even closer when he says, and we can see that God is with you. Man, he said, he's just right there, just a quarter turn. If he could have said, and I can see that you're God in flesh, he'd have been home. But he stops just short. And so Jesus talks to him, and I want to back you up into John chapter 2. Now remember that men put the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible. God didn't do that. That's not in the original text. Uh, chapter 3 is probably not a good chapter division. I want you to back up, and I want you to look at verse 23 of chapter 2. And I just want to read for you a second, because I want this setting of why John 3.16 comes where it does. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. Now, John keeps calling for people to believe in the name of Jesus. Okay, so many people saw the signs and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Now, I want you to understand this. The word, when it says many, they, they believed in his name, that word believe is the exact same word as the word entrust or commit himself to them. What it basically says is they're believing in him, but he ain't believing in them. And the reason is he did not need testimony about mankind. He knew what was in every person. So Jesus knew that they were close, but they weren't there. He knew that they were coming because of the miracles. They knew, he knew that they were coming because he's a teacher, but they're still not coming because he is God in the flesh. 
They're not ready yet. And so he makes this statement, if you want to come to God, you've got to be what? Born again. And unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You'll never recognize it. Now that turns them on their head because they thought, well, everybody that's born a Jew is God's child. You're just born into it because we're Jewish. You get your little cap and you go through a bat mitzvah and you do all that stuff and you're Abraham's children. That's the way it works. So you're born of God when you come into this world if you're Jewish. And Jesus says, no. Mm -mm. If you're not born again, not only can you not see the kingdom, you can't see me. When you get born again, that's a spiritual exercise. Being born again is an event that comes straight down from heaven. And it's Holy Spirit involvement. And if you're not born again, you can never be reconciled to God. What Olivia just did this morning, <coughs> that's all there is. That's being born again. But if you're not born again, if you don't give yourself to the Lord, if you don't commit to the Lordship of Christ, there's no reconciliation. And so Jesus says, this, being born again, is a spirit-controlled activity. And the spirit can't be controlled. Now, that's one of the problems. We often try to control the Holy Spirit of God. You can't do that. We'll talk in a little bit about all you can do is watch it and say amen and hallelujah. Because the spirit's going to do what the spirit's going to do. But in our text today, in John 3, here, here's basically what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. Nick. You're almost there, but you're not there. You're not quite to the point where you need to be. You still can't see the kingdom. You're just not quite there because you've got to be born again of water and spirit. And Nicodemus is going to say, what do you mean? Am I supposed to go back into my mother's womb again at old age? Now, that's being facetious. In all likelihood, he's questioning, what do you mean born again? I'm born a Jew, all right? All right. What do you mean being born again? Now, he's probably an older man at this time. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. And what Jesus says is, you've got to be born of water and spirit. Now, I want to help us understand that, okay? Because when he says being born of water at this point, he's not talking about baptism. It hadn't been instituted. You've just got the baptism of John. He may be talking about the water that sanctifies in the Old Testament that God will sprinkle you with sanctified water. Very good likelihood he's talking about birth because that's what Nicodemus is talking about. Well, I'm born a Jew. Yeah, all right, you've got to be born of that water, but you've got to be born of a spirit because, and here's what Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. And Jesus is amazed. The text says it. Jesus is amazed, and he says to him, you're telling me you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know this stuff? All right, if, if, if your teachers are lost, folks, that's what, what's that mean about their followers? <laughs> I ain't got a clue. So, uh, your teachers don't get... Here you are, a member of the Sanhedrin, and you don't know about flesh and spirit? Are you kidding me? So in verse 12 of chapter 3, Here's basically what Jesus is saying. I've done all I can do for you. I've taken you as far as I can take you. You're asking questions that only the Holy Spirit can answer, and you ain't got him. If I'm sharing with you, and this is a direct quote from Jesus, if I'm sharing with you earthly things and you can't swallow them, how are you on earth going to swallow heavenly things? without the Holy Spirit of God. They're making a study of things, and Nicodemus is a good example of why Jesus didn't commit himself to those people in two. They're making a study with no skills to study with. They're, they're trying to understand things that they don't have any ability to grasp. And Jesus even says, you got testimony after testimony, but you're not hearing it. You're not listening. And church... Sometimes we just need to get quiet and listen. And instead of arguing earthly things so much, claim the spirit that God has given us and learn to look through spiritual eyes. And when you see the Holy Spirit at work, then probably if, that ain't, if that's against your belief system, you probably need to change your belief system and get in line with the spirit of God. Because God's trying to teach us something. And he 
he says, you, you got all these testimonies, Nick, but you ain't getting it. In, chapter thir- in verse 13, Jesus is going to take a shift, okay? In 13, he goes from being the teacher to being the Messiah. And in 13, he starts teaching, look, I am come down from heaven, and I am going to open up the new birth for all of you. The new birth is going to happen because of me. And so the Spirit comes like the wind blows. You know when the wind blows, right? Did you hear it come in last night? Boy, I did. I woke up. I thought, there's the north wind. It's going to be cold in the morning. Uh, And sure enough, it was. I couldn't see the wind, but I knew it was there. And Jesus says the Spirit's that way with the new birth. You you can't see him, but you'll know he's there. You just got to trust God. And then Jesus says the most majestic thing. The only person that knows the truth, Nick, that you're wanting is somebody that's been in heaven and come down here. Now, who's that? That's Jesus, and that's only Jesus. He is the only one that's been into heaven and come to earth. Folks, that right there is why we're doing a red-letter Bible study. Jesus says, I'm the only one that's ever been in heaven and come to the earth, and if that's true, and it is, I want to listen to him. I want to hear what he says. And I want to pour myself into what he says. And I want to read it over and over and over again so that spirit like the wind blows can start helping me and start blowing through me. I want to stay in those red letters. In spite of all of that, in spite of what what Jesus has said about not committing himself to the others, basically he says, okay, Nicodemus, I'm going to tell you why I came. Even though you're not there yet, they're not there yet, I'm going to tell you why I came. I'm going to give you the answer you're looking for. Somebody's got to die. Somebody's got to pay the price for all the sins of the world. Somebody has to show the world what love is. Somebody has to do what you can't do. So Nicodemus, here's what's going to happen. Jesus returns back to Numbers chapter 21. Read it today. Numbers 21 The people start complaining against Moses, but that ain't enough. They start complaining about, guess who else? God. Mark's right. He started nodding as soon as I said that verse. They start complaining about God, and they say things like, you know, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? He's going to get us out here and feed us this crummy food you're giving us. Doesn't he got no taste to it? Uh, Why didn't you just let us die? I mean, they're just really whining. So God sends poisonous snakes. How many of you like snakes? Great story the other day. We were getting our fall stuff out of our shop, the fall stuff, and we keep it all in crates. Christmas stuff's upstairs, that's sacred, holy of holies. Uh, Fall stuff, who cares? That's in our shop, and so we're bringing all the boxes in so Melissa can put out pumpkins and all that stuff we got, And, and, and and so I brought them all to the porch, and she was taking one in, and this snake about that long stuck his head up out of it. <laughs> that was greatness, boy. Uh, you talk about how fast a, a, something can hit the ground. Woo! It hit, that, shake, that snake was shaking up. Uh, anyway, I got him, and, and he's dead. But Jesus goes back to Numbers 21, and what God did is he sent these, these uh, poisonous snakes into camp, and people were getting bit. And God told Moses, you make you a snake and you put it on a pole and you hold it up. That's not going to prevent snake bites. What it's going to do is all you got to do is look at it. You ain't got to do nothing. You just look at it and you'll be healed. And Jesus pointed, just like that snake had to be held up so everybody could be healed, I got to be lifted up. And later in John, he's going to say, if I'm lifted up from the earth, what will I do? Man, I'm going to draw all men unto me. Now, how many of you want to claim that promise? You lift me up, I'll draw all men. That is an absolute promise in the red letters. Lift me up, I'm going to draw all men. Folks, that's why as a church we've got to lift Jesus up. Just Jesus. We've got to constantly lift up Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do his work. And we've got to believe that if we're lifting up Jesus and a visitor comes in here, they're going to feel the wind blow. And God's going to call them to him because that's what God does. And so lifting up Jesus is our job. Now, knowing all of that, here's what John 3.16 says. You know it like the back of your hand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that Everyone, anyone, whosoever, no exceptions, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That was his, that was, that was his speech to close the argument with Nicodemus. Now, if Jesus ends the debate with that verse, you reckon we ought to? You reckon sometimes when we're talking to folks about theology or differences or who does what or who does what practice you've got, how about if we ended every talk with, you know what, Daryl, God loved the world so much he gave us his only boy so that whoever believes in him ain't going to die, going to live forever. God bless you, brother. See you next time. You think that might change our hearts and minds a little bit? That's how Jesus almost ends this thing but he gets close, and then he continues. And by the way, eternal life, and we need to get this, eternal life is not just the length of life. You know, if nothing changes, I'm not sure I want to live forever. Everything is falling apart. Eternal life is not just how long you live, it's the quality of life you have. You will have eternal life. You ain't never going to die, but the life you're going to have is like the life Jesus came from. And then Jesus says, I didn't, I didn't come to condemn the world. It's already condemned. I did not come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. And I gave the world light. Now, the darkness doesn't like the light because when you shine light in darkness, it shows everything that's wrong. And if you're not ready for Jesus, you don't want nobody looking at what's wrong. If you fall in love with Jesus, you don't care if anybody sees what's wrong because you've been redeemed. And Jesus basically says this. If you will live in the truth, and our mind instantly goes to rules, just like Nicodemus, 613. If you will live in the truth, in the book of John, who is truth? Jesus. Jesus is not saying if you will live in rules, you'll walk in the line. He is saying if you will live in me, if you will take that spirit, and if you'll follow where the wind blows, you will now walk in the light. Straight out of Jesus' mouth. So what happens to old Nick? Well, we don't know. Now, Nicodemus later will stand up for Jesus when they're wanting to uh, get him without a trial. We know he'll stand up for him. We know that Nicodemus is going to help bury Jesus. And after that, we lose touch with history. But we do know that when Jesus dies on the cross, Nicodemus gets with a fellow named Joseph of Arimathea. And those two gentlemen, now Joseph, by legend and by good research, is very possibly the uncle of Mary, Jesus' mama, which means he is Jesus' great uncle, the uncle of God. And by the way, that makes sense, because if he is his uncle, it comes on his level of patriarch to go take care of the body. So we know that Joseph and Nicodemus requested when Jesus died, can we have his body? Now that's an unusual request. Uh, and the Romans usually left the bodies up there and let, let the crows and buzzards eat them. It took a lot of guts to ask for his body because now you're asking the Romans, and not only are you asking the Romans, you have your Jewish followers looking at you thinking, what are you doing? Why are you honoring this person? It was an expensive thing because Nicodemus spent a lot of money buying 75 pounds of spices. Joseph puts him in a tomb that nobody's ever been in. That fulfills scripture. Jesus doesn't even have a place to be buried. He never did have a place to lay his head, right? And we lose sight of Nicodemus after that day. But history tells us that Joseph of Arimathea, by the command of Philip, went to Great Britain and became a missionary and established strong churches because he was born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. God bless. Well, with the Texas Rangers finally in the World Series, I thought I would close with a true baseball story that has a lot to say about God, salvation, religion. 
The day after I graduated from high school in 1957, I had the awesome opportunity to sign a baseball contract with the St. Louis Cardinals. Pray I didn't sign it. With me was my good friend Lindy McDaniel from Arnett, Oklahoma. Lindy signed his. Now his contract was a lot different than mine. He got a $50,000 signing bonus. $50,000 in 1957 was a lot of money for an 18-year-old kid. Lindy was an awesome guy. He loved God with all of his heart. He did a lot to change baseball and what it said about God, by the way, through the years. He was a phenomenal guy. Three months later, three months to the day later, he pitched against the Los Angeles Dodgers in the major leagues and beat them two to one. That's how good he was at 18 years of age. He had two things in his contract, and he pitched in over 500 baseball games for 21 years in the major leagues. A lot of the younger set don't even believe this now. They don't think it can happen. The two things in his contract, he would always go to a worship service every Sunday. Can you believe a Major League Baseball player that good, that important to the team? Saying, I'm going to worship God every Sunday for the 21 years I'm playing baseball. And he did. The second thing, he said, I want to put out a, a track. I want to put out a weekly bulletin, except it's monthly, to every baseball player and manager and coach in baseball. It's called Pitching for the Master. He did that for 20 years one years. Scores and scores of baptisms into Jesus Christ through pitching for the master. And by the way, who all did he pitch for? Oh, he pitched for the New York Yankees for many years for a lot of World Series. He pitched for five different baseball teams. He's one of the greatest pitchers in the history of baseball, but he was truly the greatest Christian. What did he do when he finally retired? Well, he moved to Dallas, Texas to keep on preaching. Why is he so close to me? He was my best friend. In the off-season, he would attend Abilene Christian. I got to help him work up his first sermon. He preached it in Hamby, Texas. And every year that he came to Abilene Christian, I'd spend many hours teaching my precious friend how to preach, how to pitch for the Master. And when COVID hit in 2020, just a week apart from my wife's death, he died with COVID. At that time, he was an elder at the Levon Church just outside of Dallas and a preacher for the Levon Church. 21 years. The third thing in his contract, I gave you two of them, that he would be designated not as a baseball pitcher, but as a gospel preacher. 21 years, many, many World Series, one of the greatest pitchers of all the time. But remember me as a gospel preacher for Jesus Christ. Father, help us really be interested in the important things in life. Sometimes we get our priorities mixed up. But help us always realize the story of Nicodemus and what God called him to do, and what you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.